and welcome to the Entrepreneurs in a Game podcast. I love to have exciting guests on the show, and today I am thrilled to welcome Mark Morwini. He is a lifelong entrepreneur who helps coaches get more clients without paid advertising. He achieves this with his coaching programs, his podcast called Natural Born Coaches, his Facebook group, The Coaching Jungle, and his exclusive print newsletter, Secret Coach Club. And I was saying to Mark just before we came on, uh, before we came on live, that his is one of the few emails I read daily. He's been a speaker at events like Social Media Marketing World, frequently makes media appearances and contributes for Entrepreneur Magazine. You can learn more about Mark at www.naturalborncoaches.com. Mark, a very warm welcome to the Entrepreneurs in a Game podcast. I'm so thrilled you're here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Nina. So, Mark, let's, let's start before you became a coach. How did you get into coaching? What motivated you? I'd like to say there was a grand master plan, but there wasn't. <laughs> so, in, in a nutshell, uh, I had a uh, real estate business right out of university. So, I started doing that at 21 years of age. Um, I worked hard, I built it up, it got to the point where I had about 100 agents and employees at a couple office spaces and uh, everything was going great. A hockey stick growth every year, you know, that uh, upwards trend. And then bang, uh, a little over a decade ago, everything went kaput and collapsed and I lost everything. Uh, went through bankruptcy, uh, divorce a few years after that. And just uh, after a decade where it looked like nothing could go wrong with what I do, everything I touched turned to gold. Uh, everything I touched turned to crap for a few years. And that's actually how I got into coaching. It's kind of a zigzaggy type journey, but um, I was helped back to my feet by several coaches and mentors and uh, they got me back on track. And then I started my coaching business in early 2014. And here we are today. Amazing. That was quite a turnaround for you. It was. Um, now, that I don't want to go through that experience again, but I'm grateful for the lessons from it because it uh, helped me de uh, develop a thicker skin. That was one of them. And uh, there are a lot of positives that can come from a bad situation. And just uh, I would rather not experience them again. I learned the lessons. <laughs> no more. <laughs> yeah. And some of the most successful people in the world have had the biggest failures. And they it's, it's the resilience, isn't it, which is the key thing, being able to pick yourself back up and keep going. What were some of the big lessons you learned from that? Well, the issue that I had had, I'm on the east coast of Canada. I'm in a small province. The whole province, there's 750,000 people. We're not London like you, um, you know, in a city of roughly 100,000 people. And uh, it's a type of area that uh, it's getting better, but it's not terribly entrepreneurial or supportive of entrepreneurs. So whenever there's a business closure, you've got, you know, the, it's in the media and everyone's running them down like it was planned. Uh, so it's a little different than a, you know, London, my business was in London, it wouldn't even make page D24 of the local, of the Daily Mail or whatever, or California or any of these big places. But because it was on the East Coast of Canada, it's this really big deal. And um, when it first happened, when I was getting kicked around by the local media and some former employees and people I knew and stuff like that, I thought, you know, God, maybe I am as bad as they say. Am I worse than Hitler? <laughs> you know, um, I'm the only person going through this. And it was actually meeting with a coach and someone who became a mentor and friend, actually, uh, shortly after that closure that he basically said, we went out for coffee. And I don't even drink coffee. I had hot chocolate or something. But he, uh, he said to me, you know, he pointed out some local entrepreneurs. He said, uh, the best ones have gone through exactly what you're going through. And he himself had been through a couple business closures. And suddenly I turned my thinking around because I was viewing it like a scarlet letter when you go through business closure, like, oh, God, I'm the only person that's experienced this. And then I realized that unfortunately, or fortunately, that's a rite of passage for successful entrepreneurs. And that one meeting, you know, it was a one hour sit down at a coffee shop, completely changed my energy, my attitude for it. And I'm very grateful for what he did. I didn't know him from Adam when before this happened. He reached out to me because he saw me getting kicked around by the media and wanted to meet up. And I wasn't exactly in socializing mood at that point. I'm like, oh God, do I really want to go out to coffee with a stranger? I'm like, oh, what the heck, you know, do it. And I'm very grateful that I did. Absolutely. And these pivotal moments happen sometimes and there's no accidents, are they? They happen for a reason. Mm. And when you started your new, your new business, if you like, what was your mindset going into? Because you've just come out of a, you know, a setback. 
So, you know, what was your mindset? What was your thinking about starting something new? Well, I'm an entrepreneur by nature. I'm not really wired to work under, you know, corporate structure or work for someone. And I'm not knocking people who do because there's lots of people who are very happy with it. I'm just not wired that way. I'd rather jump off a bridge than work in a nine to five. Because I had so many years in real estate where I was running the show and, you know, I, I had that flexibility and I like uh, knowing if I work hard, I'm going to be rewarded for it. So I want to get back into business. Um, I was all done with real estate. You know, I, after everything, I said, I'm just sick of this. This isn't fun. And I can't see myself doing this the rest of my life anyways. What am I going to do? And I thought for a while, I had a fuzzy image of what I wanted to do. Like I was thinking, okay, maybe it's something around motivational speaking, personal development, something like that. And then it hit me where I'd been helped by coaches. I'm like, well, I really see what this can do. And this is a perfect business for me. I can work with people around the world. That was the other thing I was sick of. I was tired of working with people in my local area. And now my business is almost 100% away. I don't do any advertising local or any, any prospect, anything like that. Uh, but I want to work with people in different areas, open up my mind, you know, and, um, and just get out of the local sandbox. And I'm very glad that I did. So that, that's it. Uh, that's how I got started. I just, um, I didn't overthink it. I'm the type of person who just jumps in without over-researching it. You know, I uh, leap first instead of look, then leap. And, and uh, I'm glad it's, it's hurt me at times, but I think it's helped me more often. And that's the reason my coaching business got rolling pretty quickly is because I just didn't hesitate. And what do you, why do you think mindset is so important for an entrepreneur? I mean, it's important for everyone. You know, we're, we're all entrepreneurs here. Why do you think it's such a key thing and it can make such a big difference to people's success? Well, I mean, it's really important for entrepreneurs, any humans, uh, because we have, what, an average of 60,000 thoughts a day, and a vast majority of those are negative, or time-wasting thoughts are certainly not positive. So, especially for entrepreneurs, you and I work from home, uh, so we have a lot of time by ourselves and, and a lot of time to think and stuff. If we don't watch that thinking and control our mindset, it can veer off into a very negative direction, and then you're not going to feel like doing um, work or getting anything done. You're going to feel pretty bad. Uh, one thing I've noticed in this business, I'm grateful for real estate for what happened, because when you're running a business, it can be like a roller coaster. I'm sure you've had days like this too, Nina, where I wake up uh, seven o'clock, I get a bad email or something bad happens. Oh, geez, I'm like in a crummy mood. But then I get something good, like a good client comes in, uh, a lot of money hits my PayPal or whatever, and then I'm on cloud nine. Um, and then at two o'clock, there's some sort of frustration where someone pisses me off and I'm pissed off again. And then at four o'clock, something good happens and so on. Uh, so I've learned how to kind of ride those waves um, just from being in business so long. But if you don't know how to do that, you're going to get thrown off course by every little thing. Like you're, you're accessible by billions of people that have access to the internet and a keyboard can reach you. And if you don't control your mindset, there's just so many opportunities in the run of a day that you can get thrown off course. And how do you ride those waves of the roller coaster? I stay busy. If something bad happens, the, I feel bad, best when I'm getting work done, progress on a project or something else. Um, don't get me wrong. I do a lot of thinking time. Um, I do a lot of journaling. I've done that for years. I do a lot of reading. And then, uh, so I'm with my thoughts often. But if there's something bad that's happened, like if I had a really bad fall through or you know, something that uh, sets me off a sour mood. I just get to work on something like you mentioned earlier, daily emails. Maybe I'll write a bunch of emails, schedule them out, you know, for the next couple of weeks, or I'll work on a book or I'll work on a program or something like that. And that makes me feel better instead of sitting out the window and wallowing and looking out the window and wallowing in self-pity. And I, I love it when you said journaling. I journal every morning. So tell me about your journaling <laughs> and how it benefits you. What, what, what do you get out of journaling? How does it help you? Well, I should buy some stock in Moleskin because uh, <laughs> the amount of journals I bought, my girlfriend's like, you bought another journal? Like, I don't know. I have a weird addiction. Some people have shoes. Other people buy, you know, whatever. Books and journals are kind of my weakness. And do you um, buy different color journals or do you always stick to the same color? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty uh, standard black moleskin, either the hardcover or the soft ones. Now, years ago, I spent 
five hundred dollars on this big journal. It looked like you know those old Bibles you'd see in like a Catholic church somewhere or something. It got especially made uh, by a company in Martha's Vineyard, um, and it got shipped up to Canada. And it just felt really good writing in that. I know it sounds weird. Sounds a lot amazing. of people, a lot of people here <laughs> journaling, they think that you're writing dear diary and you're talking about you know like crushes you have and stuff like that. Uh, to answer your question, the reason that I like journaling is um, Julia Cameron talks about in the artist's yeah. way the morning pages. Uh, she recommends writing three pages first thing in the morning. Could be about anything. Could be about the weather. Could be about your kitties, litter, uh, food, whatever, just to get words on paper because it starts to free up the creative process first thing in the morning. So I tend to journal uh, first thing in the morning as part of my hour of power with reading and, and journaling, but then also to cap my day off. Here's what happened today. Who, here's who I met with. Here was my takeaways, my nuggets, my goals, and so on. Uh, so I do journaling for that reason, just to keep my creative juices flowing. There's also a record there if I ever want to go back and see what was going on, you know, back in May of 2016 or something like that. I could just go back and, and see that. But uh, I don't know. I just, uh, for me, I feel better writing it. It, it just gets it down on paper. And uh, it's a practice I've missed very few days over the years. And uh, can you share your hour of power with us? How you how, how, what you doing that? And is that the first thing in the morning to set you up for the day? Or do you do it some other time in the day? Yeah, I do it uh, for, uh, first thing in the morning. And not that I haven't done it later in the day because I do personal development. But of course, later in the day, you've got all the stresses, the frustrations and stuff that have accumulated over the hours. First thing in the morning, instead of uh, looking at your phone, which, by the way, I'm guilty of more as much as anyone else, so, so I'm not trying to say that I, I need to do better. Uh, but what I've done is instead of checking Facebook or checking email and stuff like that, I get to reading right away. Actually, this is a book I just finished this, this morning, uh, Brian Tracy's new book. Uh, get it done now. <laughs> and from reading this book, I mean, I wore out a couple of highlighters because I'm the type that wow. marks out my books with notes and stuff. Excellent book, but it right away gave me a couple ideas for emails, uh, gave me ideas for um, uh, my hard copy newsletter. There's something I'm going to talk about in there as well. That's much better than surfing Facebook or sleeping in for an extra hour or something like that. So my hour of power is, uh, is uh, reading because uh, that lets my brain wake up a bit. Then I usually journal right after that. The whole process sometimes end up going an hour and a half, two hours, but it's at least an hour. Wonderful. That sets you up for the day. Yeah, I feel better with it. Uh, on days when I don't get a chance to read as much or write, like journal as much, I notice a difference. I'm, I don't know if I'd say cranky, but I'm a little bit off uh, with that. So, And then if I'm ever driving, I'm at the grocery store, I'm uh, cleaning up around the house or whatever, I usually have a podcast or an audio book on like aud that Audible. I should buy stocks in Audible as well. <laughs> um, I'm at 2x speed too, by the way. A client recommended that years ago. And I said, oh, that's crazy. And I tried it. The people sounded like chipmunks. I said, oh, this isn't going to work. And he said, stick with it, Mark. Your brain will adjust to it. I can't listen to stuff normal speed now. I need to be 2x, unless it's a really, really fast speaker. So that's one of the reasons. I'm not a big fan of Clubhouse, You know, the new um, platform everyone's talking about. I think it could be a big time suck. Not saying it can't work for some people. One of the reasons I'm not going to be getting on it is I can't listen to it at 2x speed. <laughs> it's live and you know it's 1x speed and it's a lot of hot air so far what I've seen. So I'll stick more to podcasts and audiobooks. Brilliant. I have a, a daily mindset practice and I do mine in the morning as well. I Good. do a bit of exercise in there. And like you, the days I don't do it, I feel I'm not quite on top of things. And it's such a powerful way to start the day. And I've got to the point now where I would miss it too much if I didn't do it. So the motivation to do it is, is high. Hmm. Talking of motivation, are you, how, do you, how do you find implementing? Do you have times when you resist doing something? And if you do, how do you overcome that resistance and just get down to doing it anyway? Yeah, I think every human has some level of resistance. And if they say that they don't, they say, oh, I never procrastinate. They're probably lying. Um, that's one of those things, again, Brian Tracy's book talks a lot about it. Uh, of course, he wrote the book, Eat That Frog. So he's all about taking your hardest thing and doing it first thing in the day just to get it out of the way. Um, but for me, uh, for procrastination, what I find uh, helps is, and I've had to learn this, I'm an admitted workaholic. Uh, so I could very easily work 24-7 uh, and I could justify it as well. And that's a bad habit that was built during my real estate life. Uh, so what I find when I'm working too many hours 
it's not productive because I know I'm not on my A game and I'm just doing busy work just to, to do it. So what I've made a really big effort for is to make sure when I'm working, I'm working. When I'm playing, I'm playing. And then there's no crossover or bleeding in between the two of them. So you mentioned the daily emails before. I don't sit down and write one a day just before they go out. I usually batch write them. I'll take a couple hours and I'll write a, a week's worth of emails uh, with I could get in the flow and then that's it. If I did it the other way, I would probably not have continued the streak. I think I'm at about 1,800 straight days without a day missed. Uh, but if I sat down in front of a blank screen, there'd be some days and oh, God, I'm just not feeling this. And then the streak would be broken. And how do you get ideas for writing daily emails? Oh, boys, uh, they come all over the place once you've been doing it for a while. It's like building up your muscles in the gym. It's building your content creation muscles. Uh, I get them stories from my life, uh, stories from my clients. And that's keeping confidentiality in mind, of course. Uh, stories from uh, if I'm watching movies, shows, uh, books, because I mentioned I highlight a lot of my stuff. If I'm ever stuck, I go to my bookshelf and I can pull out a book and there's an email in there uh, just from that. I get ideas from uh, boys, uh, my Facebook group. You know, there's 20, over 20,000 members in the coaching jungle uh, group. So I can scroll the wall. I can say, oh, that's an interesting question someone answered. I'm asked, I'm going to answer it in my emails and the next day. Um, I also get it from Facebook memories is a great thing. And this is a cheat, uh, cheat code uh, for it. If you're ever stuck, if you go to facebook.com slash on this day, it'll show you what you posted this day, one year ago on this day, two years ago, three years ago, and so on. So you could pull something that you wrote years ago and use that as an email. Um, or you can recycle just about anything that you've put out there. I've never had anyone say to me, Mark, you, uh, recycle this. You used this email four years ago. And people aren't going to say that. Um, it'd be strange if they did. But so, uh, yeah, there's just a few of the places I get my ideas. Wonderful. It's quite a commitment, isn't it? It is. It does get easy, though. And um, the one thing I'll mention too with my daily emails, I squeeze a lot of juice out of that orange. So my daily email goes on to my blog, which helps with SEO and other things. It also goes into my Facebook group and other places on Facebook. It goes to LinkedIn, goes to Twitter. It's going everywhere. So that one piece of content is uh, really going all over the place. So people say to me, oh, my God, you must be on your laptop 24-7 writing all the time because I'm seeing you all, all these places. Well, I cheat a little bit because I repackage my content. Wonderful. And when you, you talked about the big setback that you had back in, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring around 2008, 2009, how do you get over setbacks now in your business? When something goes wrong, as you said, you know, you get an email or something just, you know, annoys you or just throws you off. How do you get past that with your thinking so you can then focus on the next thing that you want to get done? Well, I think where I went through that bad experience and it felt like hell at the time I was going through it that makes everything now seem very minor. So if I get a troll messaging me from Timbuktu that says something like just trying to egg me on, I'm not going to spend all day arguing with the person. I might use what he or she uh, says for content fodder, you know, for future email or something. But um, I don't want to say everything sunshine, lollipops and rainbows, but really when I compare my business now to the stresses that I had back with a hundred person, uh, team and real estate and everything else, they're pretty minor. You know, I'm, I can't even think of what the worst thing is, let's say in 2021 that's happened. Uh, I had a couple of clients that had to uh, need a little bit extra time to pay, you know, and that I guess was, I won't say it's frustrating. I'm like, oh, okay. But it's not like I'm ready to jump off the roof because of that. I'm like, okay, that's life. Um, I can't say there's anything that's been really too bad. Knock on wood. And what's the biggest lesson that life has taught you so far? Um, there's an acronym that Robin Sharma uses in one of his books, and it's KMF. And KMF stands for keep moving forward. And I know it sounds really cliche. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, keep moving forward or what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Or when one door opens or closes, another door opens and all this stuff. But it is something that I remember. There's two acronyms that I keep front and center. I should tattoo them on my body somewhere. I haven't. Uh, one of them is KMF, keep moving forward. Uh, the other one comes from uh, Elvis Presley, TCB. And uh, Elvis used to have uh, 
chains that he gave the Memphis mafia and all his friends and had TCB with a lightning bolt. And that stands for taking care of business. And so I always think, you know, uh, that's what I want to be known for. You've probably seen this, Nina, in the online space. There's a lot of flaky people who are entrepreneurs. They're just not on the ball. So they say they'll do something. They never do it. They don't show up for scheduled appointments. They're just, they're flaky. There's no other way around it. I want to be the opposite of that. You know, I want to make sure I'm taking care of business. Wonderful. And I know you have a passion for helping your clients who are many coaches to get more clients. You have a huge media following. You've got a very successful podcast. You've got a very successful mastermind. What's the one, if you were to put your success down to one thing, what would it be? It's funny you ask that question because I'm in the process. Uh, This month's Secret Coach Club hard copy newsletter is a special theme one around what I say is my number one superpower. And that's, um, it's not flight or super strength or anything. I'm a Superman fan, so I wish I had those things. Uh, But it's actually consistency. And consistency is uh, not always really sexy or exciting. But that right there, that that someone asked me, what's your uh, number one superpower in a previous interview? Right away, I said it's consistency. So it's just showing up every day, doing those things I have to do. So my podcast, I'm just about to release episode number 700. Uh, that's coming out shortly in the next uh, two weeks, a week and a half. Um, 1,800 days of emails, uh, grew the Facebook group to over 20,000. And all that time I showed up every day and where I was, like social media platforms, everything else, email, just to make sure that, hey, I'm here and I'm, I'm going to be consistent. So to answer your question, I would say consistency. And it doesn't happen as if by magic. And it may look easy to the outside world that, you know, you're pumping out all these episodes and emails, et cetera. But there's an incredible amount of hard work and planning and just showing up and doing it. And if every entrepreneur had a really great mindset and, you know, they were implementing every day on the key strategies, they're likely to be very successful, aren't they? They are. There's actually a quote I'll share with you. It's funny you asked this because it comes from the book. You'd swear I'm an affiliate for Brian Tracy's book, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> but, if, but in his book, he gave a, a quote, which I think ties into what you just said. It's from Albert Hubbard. He said, self-discipline is the ability to make yourself do what you should do when you should when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. And that sums up my business because uh, there's some days I'm not feeling like it, but I just roll up my sleeves. I say, OK, I'm going to get it done. Um, it's kind of like kids with eating food. You know, my mom used to say not every day can be a fun day. So as a kid, I would like to eat pizza, hamburgers, fries, hot dogs if I could every day. But there would be uh, certain days when you'd have to eat uh, vegetables and stuff that's not terribly tasty. And she'd say every day can't be a fun day. And I think that way as well. I mean, I have fun with my business, but you're never going to be firing an all cylinders 24-7. You're going to have some off days. And it's just showing up when you can and, and can keep that ball rolling. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld talked about his calendar exercise when an aspiring comedian asked him how he got so good. Uh, with stand-up or with comedy and uh, Jerry Seinfeld said he writes a joke a day and every day that he writes a joke he puts an axe through that day on the calendar and then he builds up a streak of axes so he doesn't want it to fall up away and stop you know he feel, would feel guilty about it so it's all about extending those axes uh, as much as you can. Yeah, that's a great way of um, looking at it. So, you know, visually you can see this unbroken line of X's, but there must be days when you just don't want to do it. You don't feel like doing it. So how do you get past that? I know now you you probably tipped over the other side where consistency is just, it would be almost unthinkable to break it. But at the beginning, when you were building up that consistency and, you know, you just didn't want to do it that particular day, how did you make yourself do it even if you didn't want to do because there's such a conflict isn't there within that I don't want to do this but I should be doing it and normally I don't want to do it wins (laughs) I'll do it tomorrow and I have to thank the haters and the critics uh, that were kicking me around when my business closed uh, back in 2009 I went through another closure in 2012 so I had two business closures in the span of a couple years so I accumulated my share of enemies Uh, If I was ever laying in bed and uh, it's still dark outside, I know I have to get up to get working and I'm just like, oh, I'm going to stay in this nice warm bed or whatever. I would picture those critics and haters at the end of my bed 
and kind of almost mocking me. And uh, I know that uh, it sounds funny to say this because I'm not thinking about my critics all the time. Uh, but if I need an extra push, I think of them like I want to prove people wrong. Uh, when my business closed, a lot of people wrote me off. They're like, oh, he's done. You know, he'll be end up in a box under a bridge somewhere, you know, and he'll never be back in business. Uh, so I get a, a perverse delight out of um, annoying some people when they see me back on my feet because so many people did kick me when I was down. So that, that's how to do it. Um, it's negative motivation in a way. I had a guest on my podcast actually who used something similar. She's a book writing coach. Uh, so with her clients, if they were hesitating writing their books and they didn't know if they're going to hit that deadline, she would say to them, uh, tell me a person or an organization that you absolutely hate, you can't stand. And they would tell her whoever, could be a politician, a group, whatever. And she would say, I want you to write me a check, or sorry, write a check for $1,000 to that person or organization. Give it to me. If you don't finish your book by this date, I'm mailing it in. <laughs> so and, and maybe it would work. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a few people hate Donald Trump, you know, and uh, stuff uh, that, that they could use it with that. And well, now that I guess the election's done, but before the election, hey, if you don't finish your book by this date, you're going to make a donation to Donald Trump or to Joe Biden on the flip side. Um, I did this once with a client of mine who was hesitating opening his Facebook group. He set up the Facebook group with just me, and then he invited uh, he had himself and invited me into the group. And then I saw him tinkering away with the banner for the group and doing little stuff that wasn't, you know, it was basically a way to feel busy but not put it out there. So what we finally did, I did that practice with him. I said, who do you hate? Any organization? He said, well, I guess the KKK, <laughs> the Ku Klux Klan. And I said, okay, if you don't get your group up by Monday, I said, how about you have to donate to the KKK? You're then going to be on their mailing list. You're never going to be able to run for president and all this other stuff. Um, after weeks of delaying, he got that group live <laughs> in plenty of time because he's <laughs> he committed to it but he's like i'm not going to donate to the kkk so that group was put up and uh, there's a little bit of negative motivation which i've used and my clients have used as well and do you use that with your clients yeah i did I, that, he was one client that i did because i think it was about three weeks of delay with his facebook group i could not get him to launch his group literally all he'd have to do is click publish or go live or whatever at the group turn it to public he would not do it uh, until we brought the kkk into it so Fantastic. I love that. That's a great hack. I might start using that with um, yeah. on myself and with my clients as well. I would love it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I'm guessing that if there was one thing that you would say to our audience today is be consistent. I think that's a great one. The moral or the lesson of the day. The uh, lesson of the day. And it's a great lesson. Mark, how can our listeners and our viewers find out more about you and the terrific work you do? Sure. So you could go to naturalborncoaches.com. Uh, we've got 700 podcast episodes and pretty much any topic imaginable for coaches. Uh, my Facebook groups, The Coaching Jungle, that's at thecoachingjungle.com. And my hard copy newsletter, secretcoachclub.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been such a joy having you on today. And I've learned so much about how to be consistent and show up. And for everyone who's been watching and listening, thank you so much for your company as always. Till next time, bye-bye for now.